Two, four, six, seven. All right. Perfection. All right. Let's. Uh, we got to chapter ten. Was it seventeen? Okay. You and Patrick are in agreement. On the side of two witnesses. It's verse seventeen. All right. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and the blessings you give us. Thankful for the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. We're so thankful for your word that we have before us that all the years that your prophets and apostles have revealed these, you revealed to them and they've written these things down. We have these truths to study and learn from. We pray that we'll take them into our hearts and live by them day by day. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read 17 and 18. He says, Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. <coughs> For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land uh, at this once, and will distress them, and they, that they may find it so. Let me go ahead and read down to 22. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore, to keep set up my curtains, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore... They shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold the noise of the bruit, or jackals, is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Okay. <laughs> Gather up thy wares, verse 17. Uh, Oh, out of the land of the fortress, my margin says, under the siege. Thus shall the Lord behold, thus saith the Lord, that's Jehovah, behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once and will distress them that they may find it so. So, he's just talked about idolatry. And now he's shifting back to God's uh, response to their abandonment again. And then he goes on in verse 19, Woe! Me is my hurt. He's talking about what uh, Israel, his people, have done to him. He said, God said his wound is grievous. He's grieving over it. Uh, my tabernacle is spoiled. All my cords are broken. Children have gone forth from me. Uh, he, he is talking as if he's a, a, a man with his children have abandoned him. And then he says, for the pastors or the shepherds, and uh, more than likely these are the leaders in the city. He says, they become brutish. My margin says, dull-hearted. And they have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Uh, and he talks about a great commotion out of the north country. Well, this always refers to Babylon coming. He keeps going back, reminding them uh, what's going to happen, and he makes the same a den of dragons or jackals or snakes or whatever we determined last week these are, and he just paints, quickly paints the same picture again, that because of their idolatry, uh, they're going to lose everything they've got. Because they won't do what I want them to do, because they are like children that won't uh, respect and and obey their father they're just going to be lost they're going to be cut off you know, anything else down to 22 
Yeah, and we did that. Uh, he used the same words back in verse 8. Uh, to, and he used it to describe them. They're taking advantage of the people and they're mistreating them. That's pretty much it. I was, I watched a little video this afternoon. Uh, he's talking about an I, little island in the South Pacific that at one point for a few years was per capita the richest country in the world. It's a little big place. And for millennia, birds had roosted there. And the potassium in the bird dung was very valuable back in the 60s and 70s. And they started selling it. And the people on the island got rich. And they put all this money in a trust fund so that when it ran out, there'd be money for the people. But when it ran out, the politicians had already absconded with the money. So now they're the poor, one of the poorest places in the country, in the world. Uh, exactly. Um, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. People are people. Now, some people think people that believe in evolution believe, well, we're getting better. But there's no evidence of that. You know, we're getting more... Well, they think because we we have, we read, you know, read and write, and we have fancy equi uh, electrics, and from a, compared to 150 years ago, we're, we're modern and we're civilized, but we're still people. We're still people. That was an interesting. Uh, some denominational, I think it might have been a denominational preacher, that we need to be aware of the, the, the maybe the ability of evil or the, uh, the capability of evil that we have within us. In fact, that's until we realize that, we don't know that we need a Savior. Until we realize that things we're doing is wrong. So, you know, until we realize... Even as Christians, we're, we're capable of falling. We're capable of doing evil things. So uh, without that awareness, we're just going to do whatever we feel like doing. And that's what the Israelites were doing. All right, let's finish up the chapter. Verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me. But with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made excuse me, his habitation desolate. Now this is probably the best known verse in Jeremiah. Uh, preachers like to quote it. I've quoted it a lot. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It doesn't matter how much yoga you do, how much meditation, how much any of these Eastern religions you pick up, how many self-help books you read. The answers to our problems don't come within ourselves. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And uh, let's see. Proverbs 16 is, I didn't look that up. You don't get Proverb, uh, Patrick, let's see. Proverbs 16, 1. I think that says something similar. I didn't look it up. Preparations of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. That's Proverbs 16, 1. What's 20, 24?
we make decisions every day about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. But in life, and he, he sticks us here in the middle of the children have deserted him, and then Jeremiah's plea to God to temper his anger. But we don't have an innate knowledge of what God wants. It doesn't come from within us. Unless God tells us. And, that, and that's what the Bible is. So, and then this, I believe, is Jeremiah's plea to him to correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Uh, pour out thy fury upon the heathen. Or the Gentiles that know thee not, the the Assyrians, those that have already come and taken the northern tribes, all of those that don't know you, don't obey you, don't care about you, uh, destroy them. But those of us that do care and do know you, punish us, but temper it. Temper your anger so that we're not completely destroyed. I, well, he may be, he, he may be, um, he may be talking about the whole nation. I don't know. He says me, but he, he may be implying the rest of them. I don't know. Um. Okay. Correct with judgment, judgment, uh, justice, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. The American Standard says, "Correct me, but in measure, but or judgment." Um, but the plea, if you take the whole, all three verses, or yeah, three verses. Uh, yeah, those those that. Those that either don't know you or have departed from you, yes, of course they deserve. We've we have wandered away, but and and of course this prayer is going to be answered. There, he's going to he he will destroy Jerusalem. He's going to wipe out. And as we said, when we say destroy this time, not just level it, but they're going to ransack it and leave it desolate. But he will come back and restore a remnant. So he doesn't just, this time he doesn't completely destroy them. It's later in 70 A.D. he completely destroys them. Well, you know, the Babylonians are the ones he's using to punish Israel, take them into captivity. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, uh, Belshazzar, he's the one that sees the writing on the wall and is destroyed, killed that night. After that, the Medes and the Persians take over the Babylonian Empire, and we don't hear about the Babylonians anymore. They just disappear. They fade into history. Okay. That's good enough. I hadn't really thought about it, so that's that's fine. Uh, just, 
fits the text, so that's good enough for me. But yeah, those those that are going to those that have, uh, of course, the Assyrians first are taken over by the Babylonians and they're destroyed, and then the Babylonians are destroyed by the Medes and the Persians and kind of disappear from history. Uh, of course, Persia, we, modern Persia is Iran, so we really don't have Persia in the sense we did back then. But they are going to, Babylonians are going to be completely wiped out. God's going to take vengeance. He takes vengeance on his people, but even though he uses an evil people to punish his people, he still takes vengeance on the evil people for punishing. God scales balance. They always balance. Ours don't always do it. We, we put our thumb on the scale, but God's always balanced perfect. We may not, in our human judgment, and our human emotion, we may not agree with God's scales, but they balance. Okay, any other questions or comments down to the end of chapter 10? All right, let's start 11, and the first paragraph goes all the way down to verse 10. Okay, Jeremiah 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from Jehovah, the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, <clears throat> Obey my voice and do them, according to all which I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers, to make them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in this day, that I, <clears throat> the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. It's interesting, even though maybe the message is not always clear to us, God used words. The word that came to Jer Jeremiah, that he, and Jeremiah repeated this accurately. Now hear the words of the covenant, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Uh, you haven't obeyed. Not only that, but cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. And that curse is going to be coming pretty soon. Uh, and he said, this is not a new thing. From the day I brought your fathers out of Egypt, out of bondage, I've had to keep repeating myself daily, obey me, obey me, obey me. Remember when they came out, they uh, Moses went up on the mountain and they didn't know if he was coming back down, so they made the calf. Later, God told them to take the land. They said they couldn't take it. So he, when they finally went in, they, he destroyed those, destroyed them, made them wander in the wilderness. Obey me. Obey me. Just do what I say. Um, 
that I may perform the oath. Now notice this. Obey me, I'll be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Now, so God promised the Israelites a land, and he says they have it. We're not waiting for Jesus to return to set up a kingdom to give them their land. They had it. They possessed it. But because they didn't obey God, they didn't get to keep it. Now, he's going to let them come back for a few hundred years. But then he's going to take it away permanently. We discussed that Sunday morning in Revelation. Yes, there is still a city named Jerusalem. But after the destruction in 70 A.D., God leveled it, leveled the temple, and it's not his city anymore. Yes, they've rebuilt the city. They call it Jerusalem. But as far as being where God's temple is, where the people worship him, where the law of the Israelites come forth, where the high priest sits, all of that, no. It's not God's city anymore. People think it is, but it's not. Uh, and what we said Sunday morning, it's Jesus told the woman at the well, she was wondering whether we should Where's the right place to worship in the mountains or Jerusalem? And he said, soon it won't matter. Soon it won't matter. So after he died on the cross, it didn't matter. And then to make the point, God destroyed everything. So there is no temple to go back to. Yeah, uh, sincere. Absolutely. Bringing Israel back to all the political government of the United mm -hmm. States helping Britain to reestablish Israel as a nation after the World War II and the Jews and all. I mean, it was a our national national our country was involved in trying to bring them back and get it all started in the end. It's kind of interesting if they can read the rest of the Bible and somehow not clean all that up. Well, I'm replying the field, but I'll, I'll tell you what I told them Sunday is. There's three groups of people. There's three attitudes toward Israel in our country that I can see. There's the people that hate Jews, that want nothing to do with Jews in this country or Israel. There's the people that are uh, not religiously for them, but pragmatically, politically, that would be me. I think we need a presence over there, so they're an ally. Then there are those, like you're talking about, that have misinterpreted the Bible and believe they're still God's people. And that if we don't help them when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom on earth, which he's not going to do, but that's what they believe, that if we're not on his, their side, then we're going to be in trouble. So uh, I'm in the middle. I, I don't. They're not God's people anymore. The church is God's people today. But uh, I believe to have a political ally, it's not a bad idea to help them, but not because we think there's, God's going to favor us in it, no. I wouldn't favor. I wouldn't help them any more than I would help any other country that wants to um, try to be a free country. I don't know that wants to be one of our allies or friends. So I don't. Yeah, it is the idea that we make policy and we spend tax money and we do things because we think that they're God's chosen people today. That's going to come back to bite us. I'm afraid because it's not true. That's my opinion, for what it's worth. Um, he just he, he says that he has over and over and over reminded Israel they need to obey him, told them to obey him. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't do it. He says, everyone in the imagination, verse 8, of an evil heart. An evil heart. So... Being indifferent to God is evil. We can actively oppose him, be an atheist, or we can just say we don't care and be indifferent. They're both evil. The Lord, and he said, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah. <clears throat> they've turned their, they've, they're going back to the old iniquities, and they're still following the false gods. You know, they, they would raise up a judge or a king, and they'd be a good judge. Before they had kings, they had judges. And then they'd raise up a good king when there was kings, and the people would come back for a while. But now, they're all, they're all gone their own way. We covered that in chapter 
10, how evil the people have become in general. There, are there still good people in Jerusalem? Absolutely. Daniel and the princes, uh, the Babylonian names they get, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's not their Jew, Hebrew names. Uh, those are good men. There are, there are faithful Jews still in Jerusalem, but they're going to go into captivity too. God's going to hit them with a broadsword, and the whole nation will suffer. Um, any question, other questions or comments down to 10? Okay. Uh, verse 11. Therefore saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil or calamity, upon them which they shall not be able to escape, though they shall cry unto me, and I will not hearken unto them. And he's talking about the Israelites, the Jews. Excuse me. Verse 12, Then shall the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their people. Time of their trouble. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods. O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense to Baal. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in that time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What hath my beloved <clears throat> what hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil then thou rejoicest. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit, with the noise of a great tumult tumult. He kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. Okay. I will bring, my margin says calamity, evil upon them, and they shall not be able to escape. Though they will cry unto me, I will not listen to them. I won't listen to it. It's this publisher. Okay. It's just this publisher. Let me see what the actual word is here. All publishers offer something in these, but they may be right, they may be wrong. Let me double check. Word evil is rah, bad, evil, malignant, uh, sad, evil, bad, wicked, general, calamity. It can mean distress, misery, injury, calamity. Um, I don't, if you want to say an evil nation, but he's also going to bring calamity on them too. Distress, in essence, God's judgment. And they're, when they see it happening, they're, then they're going to, then they're finally going to cry for God to help them. But it's going to be too late. And he said, uh, and then they'll go into the streets and cry to their idols and their gods. And of course, they won't do anything. And he says, you've got as many gods as there are sections: uh, women with women, men with men. Um, they didn't retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them up or gave them over. He just turned them loose. He turned his back on them. Of course, he knew their hearts. But they had went far enough they weren't going to repent, and he told Jeremiah, I don't even want you praying for them. What hath my beloved to do in mine house? Now, he's referring to Israel. Israel is referred to as a bride of God just like the church is today, which tells us why the church is God's people today. Another 
indication. Uh, so Israel, she hath wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee. Well, physically, yes, the fornication and the worship, and just in general, the worshiping false gods. Uh, but when, notice this, when thou doest evil, thou rejoiceth. We don't see that today. The, the month of shame is over. They call it the month of pride, pride month, but it's the month of shame. When half-naked men parade down the street and city officials let it happen. God, if God doesn't wipe this nation out, I'll be surprised. Really, I'm, I'm, I'm sincere as I can be. I'm, I'm as serious as a heart attack that we don't deserve to go on. There's good people in this country just like there were good people in Jerusalem. But we've tolerated sin for so many generations, at least three, that, and not just sin, but I mean the killing of innocent kids and now this lewd perversion, wanting to mutilate children. I, I just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You see how long they've been doing things, and uh, I agree with you totally. It will be destroyed. I mean, we may destroy ourselves. He may let us destroy ourselves. I, I don't know if we will cease to exist, but our freedoms will be gone. The, this church building will be empty unless we want to get lined and hopefully we'll have the courage but get lined up and shot. It, it may be. I don't know how far we'll go, whether we'll just go to a European thing or we'll go to North Korea as far as not being able to worship God. But it's going to get harder and harder. Yeah, everything with traditional American values has been. And the holidays and the founders of the country mm -hmm. are all trying to just destroy them as they can. Everybody. Well, they found out. Well, that's one of the precepts of communism is you have to destroy the history. But um, we, I don't know what's going to happen, but we just have to do the best we can here. Uh, stand up for the truth. I think that's the same in the New Testament. It says the rain the just and the unjust. Mm-hmm. I, you know, whatever happens, if if evil does overcome, America will still exist. The country will be here, but there there won't be the freedoms there are now. So we either have to pray to God and do the best we can today and vote and do all of those things that a good citizen is supposed to do. But as Christians, we're, we're going to have to stand up and be counted and count the cost. I mean... <coughs> Three years ago, the government, or whoever, I don't know who was in charge of it, but they conducted their experiment to see how many people would voluntarily give up worshiping God, and a lot of people did. We didn't here. We kept the doors open. But a lot of people did. And so for the fear of a, fear of a disease or the fear of the government, they would stop worshiping God. So if they'll do it for that, imagine what they'll do if the force comes in play. So we've got to be, I think here we, we passed the test, I believe, because we, people were individually, we told everybody, you're your own person. You make your own decision. But the doors will be open. We're going to assemble at least on Sunday morning, and we did. And everybody sat apart and wore the mask, and everybody did what they felt comfortable doing. Uh, but if we obey man rather than God, what did Peter say? If you, if we, or Paul say, if we obey, if we seek to please man rather than God, we're not a follower of Christ. So, we need to get ready. It may come to the point that it's worse than it was then. Next time, it worked. Their test worked. They shut down every good thing in the country and left the bars and 
strip joints and everything open. But, yeah. Yeah, they shut some of them down, but they they would leave those open before they'd shut a church down. I mean, they'd shut the church down first. Satan people are all over, and we have to just make a decision which side we're going to be on. The Israelites chose to be on the side of evil, and God took them into captivity. Some of them got to come back for several hundred years. But then when they crucified Christ, it was over. Thirty years or so after that, forty years after that, a generation later, he leveled the city through the Romans. So if we don't learn the lessons from the past, we're going to repeat them. If we don't learn the lessons from the way God has treated his people in the past, he's going to treat us the same way. So it's up to us individually. Up to us as a congregation, what we're going to do. Y'all got any more questions or comments down to verse 11? I think so. Or did we read? Uh, I, I got 17. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments down to 17? From 17 to 17, we covered one whole chapter. It's pretty good for me. I think between you, me, and Charlie, we've said enough to get us all in trouble, so. (laughs) (laughs) If you'd like to go ahead and open your songbooks, we'll start with 475, 475, first, second, and fourth verses. Uh, Just an update. Um. Luke got off this morning uh, from my house. His family came and picked him up. Um, He had a little bit of a hiccup. He forgot his dog tags. And uh, Sarah had to run and meet his mom before they got out of town. And he finally got those. So, uh, But other than that, he's good to go. Um, And then uh, as far as our Sunday morning class, our books will be in on Friday. Um... I made an error on the shipping address, and so that's why the delay is there. Um, We got charged shipping twice, so we'll just have to write a check and get that taken care of. But the books will be in on Friday, so we'll distribute those on Sunday. All right, 475. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground is sinking sand, All other ground is sinking sand.
Brother Steve has the opening prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this day. We're thankful for the rain that we're getting. And we're thankful that you have allowed us to come here to study another portion of thy word. And we pray, Lord, that our minds were open and that we're able to soak up what we studied, that we'll be able to learn from the past on how to conduct ourselves in the future. We pray that we'll be able to take this lesson and improve our lives and strengthen our faith. We pray that you'll be with those that couldn't be here this evening. We pray that you'll be with those that are traveling, those that are sick, and that you might return them to us safely and as soon as possible. We pray as we go through the rest of this worship service that our minds will be in the right place, that we're focused on you, that we will, the things that we do, that you will accept as, as our worship. We pray that you'll be with us, give us the strength that we need, forgive us if we do wrong, give us the wisdom to, to not do it again. We thank you for the love that you have for us. It's only you sending your only son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you'd like to mark your songbooks, the song of invitation will be 702. 702. And the song before the invitation will be 488. 488. Again, we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. What is the gospel? If you ask people that, they may give you different answers. crux of it, we know from 
1 Corinthians 15. You want to say the power of the battery of the message. Paul puts it this way. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if, there's a condition, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which is also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That he was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that he was seen of James and then of the apostles. And last of all he was seen by me, that is Paul, as one born out of due time. So he says the gospel starts with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If Jesus hadn't died, there wouldn't be any atonement. If he hadn't risen, he says on down in this chapter, there wouldn't be any hope. But the gospel also is used to refer to the New Covenant, the New Testament, the whole New Covenant of Christ. The covenant is based upon his death, burial, and resurrection, but there's more to it than that. That's why Paul said in Romans 1 that he's not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power, the dynamos of God. Let's go over and look at that right quick. It is the power of God unto salvation, verse 16, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Why? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The gospel is predicated, couldn't exist. There would be no good news without the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But it is more than just that. It is God's covenant. And that is, it includes promises. We talked about promises. It, it includes promises for those that are faithful. Be ye faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. But it also, and it gives comfort to the faithful, and it gives warning to the unfaithful. <clears throat> In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7, he says, Until you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and what? Obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the gospel is powerful because it is the death it is powered by the death burial and resurrection of Christ it's powered by the blood of Christ that can redeem us it is the message that can save us if we believe it it's the message that will save us if we obey it but it has to be there are things to obey in it in Romans chapter 6 Paul said that we have obeyed from the heart that is sincerely what? Let's look down at verse 17. Verse 16. Paul says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants or slaves to obey his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Some people want to separate the gospel from obedience, but in it, there has to be obedience. As we're reading in the Old Testament, God demanded obedience of his children then, and he demands it today. He said, but, verse 17 of Romans 6, God be thanked that you were, past tense, 
talking to Christians, you were the servants or the bond servants of sin, but you have what? Obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, and then being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Well, what did they obey? What did they do? I'll go back to verse 1 of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in water baptism. Notice. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was also raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Jesus died on the cross. He paid the penalty. He arose again and gave us the hope of eternal life. That covenant that he made when he nailed the old to the cross and established the new is open to everyone everywhere throughout time. There is no limitation on it. We simply have to believe and obey from the heart that pattern of doctrine. If we will obey, we can be saved. If we refuse to obey, we will suffer the vengeance of God in the last day. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, won't you do that now? If you need to be restored, won't you come forward while we stand on this? When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on his way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Closing song is 500. 500. After this song, we'll ask Brother Charlie to lead us in a word of prayer. And one more announcement. We did not have the men's business meeting um, Sunday, so uh, we can have that this coming Sunday. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven.
Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us, and his songs our tongues employ. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Be with us. 